Our video, Allied Bombers, opens with a number of aircraft that were in the inventory of the Royal Air Force at the beginning of the war, but were already obsolete. U.S.-built bombers in the RAF were the Lockheed Hudson, which had been the civilian Electra airliner, and the Lockheed PV-1 Ventura, and was superior to the Hudson. Along with the Douglas Boston and the North American B-25, were the blue, white, and red British Roundel on their wings and fuselages. Along with them were the American developed and built four-engine heavy bombers, the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-24 Liberator. It was probably the stellar performance of these U.S. aircraft that prompted RAF Air Marshal Arthur T. Harris, better known as Bomber Harris, to accurately predict the awesome power of the U.S. Army Air Force and the part it would play in the total defeat of Germany. Among the English bombers were the Wellington, the Stirling, Lancaster, and the Hanley Page Halifax and Hampton. Our Soviet ally flew among others the Tupolev SB-2 twin-engine bomber. It had made its operational debut in the Spanish Civil War on the Republican side against the German Condor Legion and the fascist Italian Air Force. And though obsolete, continued on into the Second World War. Early on in the Second World War, it was realized that ground attack would play a vital role, and the result was the Vultee Vengeance, the first Allied warplane specifically designed for dive bombing over the land battlefield. Yeah. 1,931 Vengeances were built in four main variants with different armament and with progressively more powerful engines for a maximum speed of 280 miles per hour. The initial design resulted from a British requirement of 1940 and the type first flew in 1941. However, by the time it began to enter service in the spring of 1943, the vengeance was tactically obsolete. Therefore, a mere six squadrons became operational with the type all undertaking missions against the Japanese in the Arakan coastal region of Burma. These vengeance units comprised four British and two Indian squadrons, one of which was number eight squadron operating here out of Joari and Mamur airfields. The vengeance was a substantial two-seater. The pilot controlled a fixed battery of four or six heavy machine guns in the wings for strafing. Despite its size, the Vengeance had straightforward handling characteristics. The brakes on the upper surface of its wings checked diving speed very successfully, and the Vengeance could therefore deliver its weapons with pinpoint accuracy before recovering from its dive and then climbing with the aid of its powerful radial engine. In the rear of the cockpit, the second crewman was armed with one trainable defensive gun usually a single .50 caliber machine gun in later models. Earlier aircraft were fitted with a pair of .303 machine guns in this position. The Vengeance could carry a 2,000 pound bomb load delivered in a steep dive with air brakes extended from the wings to control speed. The vast majority of the aircraft were used in the valuable but infinitely less glamorous role of target tugs by Australia, Britain and the USA. In American service, the definitive vengeance was known as the A-35.
By the beginning of World War II, the survivors of 176 single-engined Vickers Wellesley medium bombers were obsolete, but saw limited service against the Italians in North and East Africa during 1940 and 1941. The bombs were carried in the streamlined pods under the wings. Armament comprised a belt-fed .303 machine gun in the right wing, firing ahead, and a trainable Vickers K gun in the rear cockpit. After 1941, the Wellesleys were relegated to a short career of maritime reconnaissance. Designed to meet a 1931 specification for a dual-role transport and bomber, the Bristol Bombay was, like so many other British bombers, obsolete when the first of 50 aircraft entered service in 1939. The type was an ungainly high-wing monoplane with fixed landing gear and two radial engines and could carry 24 troops in the cabin or 2,000 pounds of bombs on racks under the fuselage. With relatively little power and with fixed landing gear and minimal attention to drag-reducing features, the Bombay certainly did not offer high performance. However, the type also offered few problems to its pilots and the combination of flaps and a large, high-set wing kept takeoff and landing speeds low. The Bombay could therefore use small, poorly prepared airfields without trouble, and this was particularly valuable in North Africa. The Bombay served operationally in the Mediterranean theatre, mainly as a transport. However, it was used on occasion as a night bomber against the Italians in North Africa during 1940. The Armstrong Whitworth Whitley could carry 7,000 pounds of bombs on the power of its two engines and was a mainstay of RAF Bomber Command up to 1941 when it was relegated to an important secondary career in maritime reconnaissance and paratroop training. Great things were expected from the Bristol Blenheim, which was the UK's first high-speed tactical bomber when it entered service in 1937. The Blenheim Mark I carried a thousand pounds of bombs and could reach 285 miles per hour on its two 840 horsepower Bristol Mercury radial engines. Production of the Mark I with its short and unstepped nose totaled 1,427, built in England and also under license in Finland and in Yugoslavia. But by 1939, most had been relegated to the Mediterranean theatre. In home service, the Mark I was followed by 3,285 examples of the Blenheim Mark IV with a longer stepped nose. Despite its more powerful engines, this had poorer performance than its predecessor, but possessed greater defensive firepower and also handled well in the air. But daylight operations at the beginning of World War II confirmed two facts. On the one hand, this light bomber lacked the outright performance to escape German fighters, and on the other hand, it was too poorly protected and armed to battle its way past the fighters. 945 Blenheim Mark V high-altitude bombers were developed, but little use was made of them. The Blenheim was, however, significant as the first effective British night fighter. The Mark 1F and Mark 4F conversions had nose radar, the first operational fighter radar in the world, and a ventral pack of four fixed Browning machine guns. Despite its limitations and losses though, the Blenheim was important in providing a nucleus of crews experienced in light tactical bombing and close ground support. The first American warplane to see operational service in World War II was the Lockheed Hudson, which was a military derivative of the Model 14 Super Electra light civil transport. This rendered invaluable service as a light bomber and maritime reconnaissance plane from the beginning of the war, 
but was soon considered slightly too small for its task. In 1940, therefore, the British commissioned from Lockheed a successor, evolved from the larger Model 18 Lodestar civil transport, called the Ventura in RAF service. By comparison with the Hudson, the Ventura had a larger bomb bay, able to accommodate 2,500 pounds of bombs, compared with the Hudson's 1,000 pound bomb load. The Ventura Mark I began to enter service with Bomber Command during October 1942 and was powered by two Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP radials, each delivering 1,850 horsepower. This was soon increased to 2,000 horsepower in the Ventura Mark II for a speed of 300 miles an hour. The Ventura also featured more potent defensive armament than the Hudson in the form of two 0.303 inch machine guns in the ventral position, two or four guns of the same caliber in the dorsal turret and four nose guns. These last comprised two fixed weapons of 0.5 inch caliber and two trainable 0.303 guns. The US Army Air Force also used the type as the B-34 Lexington for coastal patrol and training. The US Navy used larger numbers as PV-1 patrol bombers with a so-called solid nose accommodating five heavy machine guns. The Ventura was not a great success in its intended role as a bomber and was in fact heartily disliked by its crews. From the autumn of 1943, the Ventura was reallocated to Coastal Command, where it equipped two squadrons and served mainly for meteorological reconnaissance. This sequence is typical of the type of daylight raid undertaken by the light bombers of Bomber Command's number no. two group in 1943. Only three British-based squadrons of number two group were ever operational on the Ventura, and one of these was 464 Squadron, based at Methwold in Norfolk. On May the 16th, 12 of the squadron's Venturas were launched on a raid against the French airfield at Morlaix in northern Brittany, at that time a base for German fighters. Despite adequate conditions for medium altitude bombing, the raid achieved only poor results. The crews, and especially the gunners, did not relax their vigilance in case a hornet's nest of fighter retaliation had been stirred up. But with no fighter opposition, all 12 Venturas returned safely to base. Total production was 2,475 aircraft, and examples of the type were also used by Australia, Canada and New Zealand. Though larger bombers could carry high-capacity bombs optimised for maximum blast effect, smaller aircraft were restricted to 250 to 500 and 1,000 pound general purpose weapons as seen on these bomb trains. Such weapons secured their effect by a combination of blast and fragmentation and could be delivered more accurately than the larger weapons. The North American Mitchell was one of the most important medium and attack bombers fielded by the Allies in the Second World War. 9,816 aircraft were produced, of all marks, up to the US Army Air Force's B-25J, and Mitchells were used in every theater by countries as varied as Australia, Brazil, Canada, France, the Netherlands, Britain, the USA, and even the USSR, which received over 860 aircraft under Lend-Lease arrangements. The Mitchell resulted from North American's NA-40 private venture prototype and was ordered, as the expression goes, straight off the drawing board during September 1939. 
This first production order model had a wider fuselage, carried a crew of five rather than three, and improved defensive armament. The four main models were the B-25D, G, H and J. RAF Bomber Command's version of the B-25D, here in service with 98 and 180 squadrons at Fulsham, Norfolk in early 1943, was known as the Mitchell Mark II, followed by the B-25J or Mitchell Mark III. Throughout the series, power remained unaltered in the form of two Wright R2600 double cyclone radials, each delivering 1700 horsepower here being overhauled at Comiso airfield on Sicily in August 1943. But both offensive and defensive capabilities were steadily increased. The glass-nosed B-25D carried 3,000 pounds of bombs and six 0.5-inch machine guns in twin-nose, dorsal and ventral installations and could achieve a speed of 284 miles per hour. The B-25J was limited to only 275 miles per hour, but was an altogether more formidable warplane, with up to 4,000 pounds of bombs and no fewer than 14.5-inch guns. Eight fixed guns were fitted in the solid nose version of the B-25J for ground attack. There were an additional six trainable guns in a twin-gun tail mounting, a twin-gun dorsal turret, and a bean gun each side. Whether bombing at height or striking low, the Mitchell was an impressive aircraft. Tupolev SB-2 was blooded in the Spanish Civil War and became the USSR's main light bomber in the period up to 1943. The type remained operational until the end of World War II, though it was progressively relegated from day bombing to night bombing and finally to target tug and other second line tasks such as training. The SB-2 was able to operate on wheels or ski landing gear for continued operations throughout the harsh Soviet winters. The two main variants were the basic SB-2 with M100 engines, and later came the improved SB-2 BIS with M103 engines. Even though technically obsolete when taken out of production in mid-1941, the SB-2 still had useful performance. Its large wing area and light loading gave it a considerable ceiling, and this made it a difficult target for German fighters to intercept. Moreover, the SB-2 possessed a rate of climb that allowed its crews to pile on extra height if they saw fighters attempting to engage. And while the SB-2's defensive armament was light, the type's agility was another useful asset in evading the attention of the Luftwaffe's fighters. Other countries that used the SB-2 were China, Bulgaria and Finland, and a total of 6,967 were built. The origins of the Baltimore four-seat light bomber lie with the same company's XA-22, which was rejected by the US Army Air Corps in 1939, adopted by France as the Martin 167F bomber, and then taken up by the British as the Maryland Reconnaissance Bomber. Serving in the Mediterranean theater from October 1940, the Maryland was initially useful, but soon revealed limitations in performance. 
The British therefore ordered the Baltimore as an improved type, with two Wright R2600 double cyclone radials, each delivering 1,660 horsepower for performance improvements that included a maximum speed of 302 miles per hour instead of the Maryland's 278 miles per hour. The bomb load remained unaltered at 2,000 pounds. The new aircraft's defensive armament was upgraded from the 6.303 inch machine guns of the Maryland to between 8 and 14 guns of the same caliber in the definitive Baltimore Mark III. This machine introduced a power operated dorsal turret to replace the manually operated guns of the two earlier marks. The new weapons layout was arranged as four fixed guns in the wings, two or four guns in the dorsal turret, as well as two guns in the ventral position, and, as an option, four fixed rear-firing guns. The Baltimore's fuselage was made large enough for the crew members to change position, something which had been impossible in the Maryland. 1,575 Baltimores were built, and though it was also flown by the air forces of Australia, France, Greece, co-belligerent Italy, South Africa and Turkey, it was with the British that the vast majority operated, in variants up to the Baltimore Mark V. In service from January 1942, the Baltimore was successful and popular, even though its bomb load was relatively small. The early marks performed sterling work in the North African desert and Tunisian campaigns, in which the Baltimore operated against German and Italian ground forces, and also helped in the vital campaign that devastated Axis shipping, trying to ferry supplies into North Africa. The Baltimore served with eight British and three South African squadrons in the Mediterranean theatre and played an important part in the Sicilian campaign, such as here, bombing near Adrano. The type was a major first-line asset during the campaign on the Italian mainland, bombing and, at times, using its wing guns to strafe tactical targets just in front of the advancing armies. Its speed made the Baltimore difficult to shoot down, and its steady, more potent defensive firepower was another reason why fighter pilots were not keen to engage the type. The Stormo Baltimore of the Italian co-belligerent air force also used the type effectively over the Balkans. Initially called the Widowmaker because of frequent takeoff and landing crashes caused by its high wing loading, the Martin B-26 Marauder was nearly taken out of production on four occasions. However, once mastered, the Marauder enjoyed the lowest loss rate of all US medium bombers. The most important models were the similar B-26B and C and the upgraded B-26F and G. The B-26G was armed with no fewer than 11.5-inch machine guns. These were trainable single weapons in manually controlled nose and beam positions, and also in power-operated twin-gun dorsal and tail turrets, plus four guns blistered onto the sides of the forward fuselage for additional ground attack firepower. Most B-26s were powered by two 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800 radials, giving a maximum speed of 283 miles per hour. Weapons load totaled 4,000 pounds of bombs. When operating in large numbers, the Marauders proved devastating. Total Marauder production was in excess of 5,000 aircraft, almost all of them flown by the US Army Air Forces.
The Wellington was one of the most important British bombers of World War II's early years, and production of the type reached 11,462 machines of all variants. The various marks of Wellington were powered by four types of engine, one inline and three radials, and in addition to bombing, the aircraft's varied uses included maritime reconnaissance, training and freighting. The Wellington entered service in 1938 as a medium bomber, and the type had a most credible bomb load of 6,000 pounds. However, though it suffered heavy losses in early daylight raids, it rapidly built up an almost legendary reputation for absorbing battle damage. This resulted from the airframe's structure, which was of the geodetic type, pioneered in the Wellesley single-engined bomber. From December 1939, the Wellington was switched to night bombing, and the two most important bomber variants were the Wellington's Mark I and Mark X. The Mark I was built with 1,000 horsepower Bristol Pegasus radial engines in three sub-variants, including the Mark I-C, of which 2,685 were produced. The Mark X was powered by 1,675 horsepower Bristol Hercules engines, and production of this most numerous Wellington model alone totaled 3,803 aircraft. The Wellington was designed for a crew of six men. These comprised the pilot, co-pilot, wireless operator, doubling as a gunner, navigator, doubling as bomb aimer, and two gunners. It should be noted, however, that Wellingtons such as these were often flown with just a five-man crew when the tactical situation permitted. All guns were .303 caliber. The two-gun nose turret and the two or four-gun tail turret were power-operated units. The single beam guns were the responsibility of one man who had to concentrate his attention on the side facing the greatest threat. In October 1943, the Wellington was phased out of service with home-based bomber command squadrons in favour of more capable four-engined bombers. The type still had an important part to play in the Mediterranean theatre, however, where ranges were shorter and German defences less formidable. The Italian campaign saw considerable use of the Wellington as a medium bomber. And these are Wellington Mark 10s at Amendola, near Foggia in southern Italy during March 1944. The Wellington remained operational in this theatre up to March 1945. Though less well known than machines such as the de Havilland Mosquito and the Junkers Ju-88, the Douglas Model 7 first flew in August 1939 and the initial order was placed by France for the DB-7 day bomber model. Most of the order remained undelivered at the time of France's surrender and were diverted to the Royal Air Force, which allocated the name Boston. The Americans then ordered their own model as the A-20 Havoc. Like the Mitchell and Marauder, the Douglas machine was a shoulder wing monoplane with tricycle landing gear and two radial engines. In this instance, right double cyclone units, each delivering upwards of 1,500 horsepower. There existed a multiplicity of designations amongst the Boston Havoc family of aircraft. The most widely used international model was the A-20C, here in the form of RAF Mark IV Bostons with 1,600 horsepower engines for a speed of 342 miles per hour. These had an armament of 2,600 pounds of bombs and five machine guns. These were two fixed 0.5-inch guns either side of the nose, one twin trainable gun of the same caliber in a dorsal position, and rear-firing 0.3-inch guns in the engine nacelles. However, the variant produced in the largest number was the A-20G, whose total reached 2,850 aircraft and used only by the US Army Air Forces. High performance, first-class handling and overall ruggedness allowed development in several roles within the overall production total of 7,478 aircraft. The Douglas bomber was also used by Australia, Canada and the USSR, which modified its aircraft with different nose guns as exceptional ground attack machines. 
The type also saw service with the Free French Air Force, and nothing better demonstrates the Boston Havoc's 40 of high-speed attack at low level than this mission. nobody was going to bomb them. At uh, Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. We cannot send a thousand bombers a time over Germany every time as yet. But the time will come when we can do so. Let the Nazis take good note of the western horizon. There they will see a cloud as yet no bigger than a man's hand. But behind that cloud lies the whole massive power of the United States of America. When the storm bursts over Germany, they will look back to the days of Lubeck and Rostock and Cologne, as a man caught in the blasts of a hurricane would look back to the gentle zephyrs of last summer. It may take a year, it may take two, but for the Nazis, the writing is on the wall. Let them look out for themselves. The cure 
is in their own hands. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Germany clinging more and more desperately to her widespread conquests and even seeking foolishly for more will make a most interesting initial experiment. Japan will provide the confirmation. In these words, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris, Commander-in-Chief of RAF Bomber Command, neatly and very strikingly summed up the rationale of the Allied strategic bombing campaign against Germany. The short Sterling was the RAF's first four-engined night bomber. Entering service late in 1940, the type was not a success in the bombing role because of its small and therefore overloaded wing. This had been imposed on the designers by the official demand that the Sterling be able to enter the 100-foot maximum door opening of the British hangars. The Sterling later became an invaluable glider tug and transport. The Avro Manchester entered service in November 1940, though potentially a great bomber, failed operationally because of the chronic unreliability of its two Rolls-Royce Vulture engines. However, despite these drawbacks, the Allies' four-engined heavy bombers were beginning to make themselves felt. The US Army Air Force's mainstay bomber in Europe was the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, of which 12,731 were produced. Designed before World War II, the type was intended for high-altitude, precision daylight bombing, with the aid of the Norden site. This is a B-17F, of which 3,405 were built, with 1,200 horsepower Wright R-1820 cyclone radials. The bomber's defence rested mainly on its bristling guns, which amounted to a single 0.3-inch gun in the nose, single 0.5-inch weapons in each of the two beam positions, in the radio operator's overhead hatch, and in each of the two cheek positions, and twin 0.5-inch guns in the manually powered tail turret and remotely controlled ventral and dorsal turrets. The maximum bomb load of the B-17 was 17,600 pounds, carried internally, though external racks could be fitted to increase this load to 20,800. Careful briefing ensured that all the crews appreciated the how, where, when and why of each particular mission. I have your attention, please, gentlemen. Pilots have all checked their crews. Everybody present accounted for. For a long time, We've all been working very hard. The work has been grueling. It produced results. And our standard of performance is very high. Gentlemen, this is the real thing. This is the first operational mission we're going on. The B-17F was flown and fought by a crew of nine comprising the pilot and co-pilot, the bombardier, the radio operator, and five gunners for the dorsal and ventral turrets and the two beam positions. The tail gunner was on his own, right at the back.
Once in the air, the flying fortresses formed up into tight three-dimensional boxes, for in this way the bombers of each formation hoped to cover each other against German fighter attack. However, experience soon showed that the box formations were insufficient against determined attacks. An escort was then provided by fighters such as the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, and ultimately, and most successfully, the North American P-51 Mustang. In their tight fighting boxes, the flying fortresses took the bombing campaign to Germany's key war industries transport and communication centers, seeking to destroy these targets with surgical precision. The bomber streams fought their way past German fighters and tried to pass round major flak concentrations so that they could reach and bomb the target in tight formation. Inevitably, there were losses to fighter attack, anti-aircraft artillery, and an accumulation of battle damage. But in 1944 and 1945, the 8th Army Air Force's B-17s struck decisive blows against Germany. With their mission complete, the flying fortresses returned to their bases in England. The flight crews rested and the ground crews took over to ready their charges for the next missions that the planners ordered. As with the Americans, the British believed in thorough briefing of its officers. In this instance, for a raid during June 1942. And I've just been told that our number is expected to be over 1,100. This group is providing 150. This station, 22 are here, and five crews are playing away. Now, the object of tonight's operation is to blot out the town of Bremen. In addition, there are two specially special targets. There's a Detmarg submarine building yard, which is a tremendously uh, important uh, submarine building establishment, and also, and even more important, the Fokker Wolf works, which are situated to the south of Bremen itself. The British counterpart to the B-17 was the Avro Lancaster, a night bomber intended for saturation bombing of area targets rather than the precision destruction of point targets. Ground crews, meanwhile, completed the preparations of their Lancasters. Maximum bomb load was a massive 18,000 pounds. For area raids, huge cylindrical high-capacity bombs were used. The detonation of these weapons, large explosive charges, providing a highly destructive blast effect. The 
The Lancaster entered service in late 1941 with 1,460 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin 20 engines. The Lancaster remained little altered except for higher powered engines and detail improvements right through a production run of 7,377 aircraft. Defence was provided by eight 0.303 inch machine guns located in two gun nose and dorsal turrets as well as a four gun tail turret. Like the American bombers, the Lancasters had to run the gauntlet of flak and German warplanes. In this instance, radar equipped night fighters. But when a target had been reached, as here by 463 Squadron over Brunswick in 1944, the effect of area bombing could be quite awe inspiring. Wave after wave of bombers tried to target the same area and, if successful, they could raise a firestorm of truly devastating power. Low-level attacks were also made, such as this on the Gnome Rhone works at Limoges in France by Wing Commander Leonard Cheshire. By the second half of 1944, the shortage of skilled pilots and fuel had turned the German fighter arm into a shadow of its former self. And this was too good an opportunity for Bomber Command to pass up. As in the continuing night campaign, the Lancaster operated with the Handley Page Halifax, which had straight-sided vertical tail surfaces compared with the Lancaster's oval surfaces. More accurate bombing was possible by day. This allowed the British bombers to strike at smaller targets, such as communication choke points and synthetic fuel production centers. The Germans countered with an effort to hide key targets by generating thick smoke upwind of the objective as the bombers approached, such as here during an attack by 617 Squadron using giant tallboy bombs on the battleship Tirpitz lying in Norwegian waters. The use of smoke was in turn countered by British use of radar and other navigational aids to accurate bombing against even invisible targets. In May 1943, further Lancaster precision bombing was directed against the Ruhr dams. In this case, the Scorp Dam, as seen from an escorting Mosquito of Nine Squadron. Though this dam was not breached, the Ada and Mona were with spectacular results. By the spring of 1945, the day and night pounding of German cities, industries, communications and fuel producing centers had made it virtually impossible for the German armies to sustain their defensive campaign against the advancing allies. Despite the incredible tonnage of weapons rained down on the enemy, the bombers still had to face the dangers of German flak guns, which often used radar direction and proved highly accurate. But the bombers were winning. One of the most versatile aircraft in America's inventory during World War II was the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Production of this magnificent type reached 18,482 aircraft, a higher total than any other American warplane of the period. 
The Liberator was supported on the ground by tricycle landing gear, and in service the B-24 proved very successful and popular with its crews, as shown by the personalization of various aircraft with nose art. The aircraft was reliable and effective, and in combat proved that it was well able to take care of itself against all but the most determined fighter opposition. In the air, the B-24 was kept aloft by a very efficient, high aspect ratio wing, accommodating the four 1200 horsepower Pratt & Whitney twin WASP engines for a speed of 300 miles per hour. Range was also maximized to 2,850 miles in the earlier variants by a deliberate decision to limit the maximum bomb load to 8,800 pounds. Its long range made the Liberator better suited to Pacific operations than the Flying Fortress. But the type was also used extensively in the European theatre as a bomber and maritime reconnaissance type. Defensive armament was typical of American practice in being centered on 10.5 inch heavy machine guns. These were located in pairs in power operated dorsal, ventral and tail turrets, in two manually operated beam positions and in the nose. These last two weapons were manually operated in the early models with a glazed nose, but installed in a powered turret from the B24H variant onward. The only other country to make major use of the Liberator was the UK, which flew both bomber and maritime reconnaissance models. Like other great bombers, the Liberator could be badly damaged yet still return to base. As this machine reveals, in an emergency landing with the nose wheel still raised, the Liberator's relatively small ground clearance could be a distinct advantage under such circumstances. The Boeing B-29 Super Fortress was designed to take over where the B-17 Flying Fortress left off. The crew members were accommodated in pressurized comfort so that the four 2200 horsepower Wright Cyclone turbocharged engines could drive this mighty bomber along at up to 358 miles per hour and at altitudes of up to 33,600 feet. Combined with this flight performance was a range of 3,250 miles and a maximum bomb load of 20,000 pounds, though the normal maximum for long-range missions was 12,000 pounds. The logical target for this mighty machine was Japan. After an indifferent start from Chinese bases in June 1944, the campaign was switched to huge airfields in the Mariana Islands. With the main effort devoted to the construction and maintenance of the five great bases on the three islands of the Marianas Group, other work was limited to essential support for the bombers and crews of the 21 and later the 20 bomber commands. Briefing was very important to ensure that the crews knew not only the when and how of their missions, but also the why that helped keep determination and morale high. 
The dangers to be faced were not just the Japanese defenses over the urban and industrial hearts of Japan, but also the long overwater flights to Japan, and sometimes with battle damage back to the Marianas. With the B-29s ready for flight, loaded with maximum fuel and the right weight and assortment of weapons, the crews arrived from their briefings. On each base, the main runway was about 200 feet wide and up to 8,500 feet long, supported by miles of taxiway and other roads. The taxiways allowed the superfortresses to move from their maintenance areas to the assembly points, close to the downwind ends of the main runways. The road networks permitted access to remote, and therefore safer, storage areas for fuel and bombs. Marshalling an attack force on the ground and then getting it airborne was a complex organizational task, but soon became a matter of well-established routine that allowed the superfortress fleet to climb and set course for its targets with the minimum waste of fuel. Each superfortress had a complement of ten men. In the forward pressure compartment were the pilot and co-pilot in the fully glazed nose. The bombardier sat between the pilots. The navigator, facing forward, was behind the pilot. One or two flight engineers, facing aft, sat behind the co-pilot, and the radio operator was further aft. In a rear pressure compartment behind the wings, but connected to the forward compartment by a crawlway over the two bomb bays, were two or three gunners for the remotely controlled guns. The rear gunner was in an individual tail compartment the superfortresses ploughed their way to Japan and destroyed both the country's major cities and its war-making capacity with attacks on industry and transport. The B-29s started the campaign in their designed operating regime, making high-altitude day attacks with high-explosive bombs. It soon emerged, however, that even with the B-29's advanced sight, bombing accuracy was poor because of the turbulent high-speed winds over Japan. The campaign was then switched to low-altitude night attacks with a mixed load of incendiaries and high-explosive bombs. The man who effectively brought World War II to an abrupt end was Colonel Paul Tibbets. Taking off from the Marianas on August the 6th, 1945, Tibbets and his crew flew his B-29, named Enola Gay, in honor of his mother, to drop a single atomic bomb over Hiroshima. Uh, we knew that the bomb had explosion, had exploded, everything was a success, so we turned around to take a look at it. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. The devastation was almost beyond comprehension. And though it took another atomic raid on Nagasaki three days later to shock the Japanese into action, the war was effectively over. The bomber had issued in a new and terrifying type of war.